Welcome to our next session for Align 2017, the summit that's dedicated to sales and marketing alignment for B2B teams of all shapes and sizes. For this session, I reached out to a guy that I've interviewed before that I cannot talk to enough that I think the world needs to hear a lot from. It's Sandler, sales management trainer, Marcus Couchy, outspoken, uh, wonderfully insightful, always entertaining to talk to. Marcus, welcome back. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you speaking uh, for this event today, man. Thanks for having me back, Jeremy. Much appreciated. Yeah, my pleasure. And we're going to do a webinar <laughs> series later this year for sure. Start by telling people, uh, before we dive in, what your background is uh, and uh, what you do with Sandler. Um, been selling since 1988. Um, got into selling selling for um, an MLM company a subsidiary uh, that was selling um, attachments for NSA. Um, got a bit of a bug for that. Uh, started developing the joy of the upsell. Um, then, when I was at university, and the year after, did that. Managed to break even, um, which was great. It was um, yeah. I probably got about five to ten years worth of experience in the one year. Um, nothing like a bit of scar tissue, um, and then decided to get trained up on someone else's dollar, which was a big mistake um, because virtually no training. Um, it was all the traditional Ada and Depeda kind of stuff, um, and lots of feature benefit selling. And I used to work really hard. I'd do research, I'd prepare presentations, and then for you know all of that effort, I get a one in twenty close rate. Um, and I started to read around the subject, um, probably read about 300 books on sales. All of them were utter tosh. Um, I did, uh, sold advertising selection, um, then headhunting and search, um, then got into uh, software, then professional services. And about 14 years ago, came across Sandler. And in the last 14 years, I've worked probably 400 to 450 segments of the market, um, everything from defense to um, naked platters, uh, comm systems to female fantasy fulfillment, coaching and spiritualism, um, hardware, software, um, accountancy, uh, legal services, uh, matchmaking, that was an odd one. <laughs> uh, and um, so we're with those guys. I mean, we took their average order value from 1,200 to 36,000 in four weeks. Um, and this sound of material is just stunning because it's the way the brain works. You sell to the other person's brain um, and it puts you into the driving seat with zero pressure. Uh, you never handle objections. You never waste time on presentations to sell. You only present for the kill. Um, you never close. Your prospect does that for you. You know you've done a good close when they say, can I give you a check? That kind of thing. Yeah, um, you guys, the, the most respected name in sales training for a reason. I, I mean, my past life as a uh, legal headhunter, law firm headhunter, uh, I remember getting a quick just one-hour training from – from Sandler, and it was by far the best thing I ever experienced. And uh, Thank you. so, start by telling people um, in the teams you're training, the the B two B sales organizations you're you're coming in to help with. What are the major issues with misalignment you're seeing, and what are some common areas that people maybe across the board could be doing better at? Okay, um, this is going to make me really unpopular, but frankly, I don't care. Um, sales is a subset of marketing. Mm. Anything that touches the customer, anything that um, internally communicates is marketing. And um, sales is an important but, and critical subset of marketing. Um, but the problem starts with the way businesses start. Um, businesses, companies, products, job functions all go through a life cycle. Same, same with markets. You have startup where basically it's all hands to the pump. You're chief cook, bottle washer, cleaner. Um, you're marketing, sales, operations, implementation, um, <laughs> and management. Uh, then you move into a continuation phase where you've kind of um, you know, ironed out the creases and you know, knocked off the edges. 
and everything's going pretty smoothly. And you only have two places to go from there. You can either go into growth or you can go into turnaround. If you go, go into growth, you suffer a whole heap of new pains. Um, you're constantly trying to backfill. You're in danger of overtrading. Um, you're constantly having to recruit. Um, you're having to hunt for new business. You've got to expand your existing accounts. And if you go into turnaround, then basically, um, you know, the nasty stuff has hit the fan. You're wasting um, resources. You've probably got internal conflict. You've got uh, structural tension between departments. You've got um, people who don't really have clarity as to what they're expected to do. And most of these problems start with atrocious management um, that lacks vision, is ambiguous in their expectation, hires the wrong people, often in their own image, only weaker. And once you've come out of that, then you move into recovery where you're looking your wounds and you only have two places to go there, which is back into turnaround um, or into growth. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the challenge here is that the majority of organizations are led by two types of people. Um, they're either finance or they're sales. And I'm not entirely sure either of those are a good thing because if you look at that life cycle, um, a business starts up with a technician, someone who's good at doing stuff, an accountant, uh, a software developer, a, a consultant. Um, and they're a technician in Gerber's uh, you know, uh, triangle. So you have a technician, a manager, and an entrepreneur. Now, after they iron out the creases, they say to themselves, you know, I hate selling. Um, I'm not really a natural born salesman, so let me go out and buy myself um, some sales resource. And they burn through three, four, five, six, 10, 15, 20 bad salespeople. Um, eventually, they find a salesperson who's halfway okay, um, and they move into either growth or into turnaround. Um, sales moves into continuation, and sales says, get me a marketing person uh, who can do all the drudge work that I don't want to do, uh, like lead generation. Then what happens is the business either moves into recovery or carries on in growth. Um, sales moves into growth or into turnaround. Marketing moves into continuation. And they think, I need a finance director. And this cycle carries on. And the finance director then needs an HR. And so what you've got is the wrong people, um, yeah, the lunatics running the asylum. Because I think <laughs> marketing should control sales. Um, the problem is that most marketing isn't sales-led or sales orientated. Um, it's uh, dealing with faffy stuff, uh, like making stuff look pretty, uh, branding. Um, uh, and you know, that stuff has its place, but that's the cherry on top of the icing, on top of the marzipan, on top of the cake. Um, <laughs> marketing's only function in life, as far as I'm concerned, is to put profit on the bottom line and to enable sales to do their stuff. Um, sales' job is to go out into the jungle with a shotgun and bring home prey, uh, but your average salesperson uh, goes out into the jungle with a strimmer and comes back with the odd leaf. Um, and all of these problems start with recruitment because recruitment is where 99% of management problems begin. Um, if you hired the right people in the first place, you wouldn't have management problems. And most of those problems stem from bad leadership, which uh, stems from lack of clarity, and all of that creates misalignment. You listed a great a series of words that kind of, I feel like, are what define great recruitment, great team building, chemistry building from the outset, which are clarity, expectation setting, consistency, standards, fairness, and consequences, and common purpose. Well, one of my favorite books and one of the best book titles I've come across um, is Ryan Holiday's Ego is the Enemy. Um, and it's a must read for anyone in life. Um, but particularly for anyone in sales, anyone in leadership, anyone in management. Um, and often what you find in organizations is that the team is not a team. They're a bunch of individuals all competing against each other. And um, I use the slightly non-PC uh, phrase of willy waving. Um, people have a tendency to try and build their own fiefdoms and empires. And so they start to compete internally. Um, and bad managers, bad leaders, have this view of divide and conquer. Um, so what they tend to do is they create the environment 
where you're competing internally against yourself rather than you and your team in full alignment competing against the competition. Um, I think one of the best ever campaigns that was developed was by JCB, and they came up with the Kill Cat campaign. If you ask the guy who cleaned the factory floor all the way up to Sir Martin Bamford what their job description was, they would say Kill Cat. And if I recall correctly, they got 19 percentage points of market share off Caterpillar uh, using that campaign because everyone knew what their purpose was. But when their ego causes them to behave in such a way that it's detrimental to the company's success, that becomes a problem. Right. And so where you have, sorry, where, where you have departments um, fighting over limited budget um, and they're not fully commonly aligned, um, then you have a major problem. And we, um, you know, in Britain, we ha we're um, uh, relatively proud of our uh, rowing team and our cycling team um, because both of them, over the last couple of Olympics, have really managed to, uh, to you know, win gold left, right, and centre. And they had a philosophy. Does it mo make the boat or the boat, uh, bike go faster? If it doesn't, stop it and do something else. If it does, can we improve it? And, and th this is a really simple philosophy. Um, but if your sales, your marketing, your operations, your execution team, your consultancy team, your finance team, your legal team are not all working towards that common purpose, then they are by definition working at odds with one another. And that slows you down. And that is a problem. If the leadership team can't come up with a reason why they exist and cannot communicate that so marketing can communicate it out to the, uh, the business and to their customer base and to the marketplace and to the competition, um, then you have a problem. You know, our business has um, a very simple purpose. It's to help people to do less but better on purpose. And enabling people to do that in their selling means that they have to constantly ask themselves a simple question. What can I do today to make my life or someone else's life easier or simpler? How can this be done more simply, more smoothly, more efficiently? And you know, cut out the dross. What is the stuff that's taking up time needlessly? What are the distractions? So one great distraction, and this is where ego really comes to play, um, is people hanging on to pipelines because of their fear that the pipeline is weak or empty. Um, and as a result, what they do is week after week across the globe, you have sales teams sat through um, these death marches, which are sales meetings, where they have to listen to nine other salespeople lie through their teeth from a forecast that was made up of fictions. Um, and managers accepting that because they're trying to manage the numbers instead of the behavior that gets you to the result. Um, the focus on lag indicators instead of leading indicators, lack of planning, um, hiring people in their own image, only weaker, instead of doing really effective predictive hiring and understanding that you hire slow and fire fast. And when you're recruiting as a manager, you need to be recruiting every day and you're building a people bank uh, of people whose strengths make your weaknesses irrelevant. So when a vacancy uh, arises or you've got budget to hire somebody new or someone leaves or you've got to get rid of somebody, then you've got five candidates who are ready waiting and want the job. Um, yeah, that can save you 12 to 16 weeks of hiring time, um, which is 12 to 16 weeks of additional sales time. On a 1.2 million pound target, that's three to $400,000. Um, so, you know, simple things like this, um, getting the team to collaborate and work with other departments. So sales and marketing, working with operations, working with resourcing, uh, working with HR, working with finance, so that they can all come up with solutions to problems that the business needs to resolve and that their customers are facing. Um, it, it, this silo mentality is lethal. You've got to start aligning your businesses. And sales and marketing are the engine room that drive all of that. Um, then you've got the execution piece. Um, e even that is part of marketing. Um, and you, you know, you've got to measure the right things. You've got to measure the leading indicators. So there, um, I'll give you a great example of this. I have a client 
who came to me in February 2016, tracking at 25% of his target. Um, a year later, uh, his pipeline had 500% of his annual target already tied up on day one of 2017. Um, he went from number 11 to number one. He focused on only two metrics. The first one was the number of unique effective conversations he was having every day um, with prospects. Uh, and a unique effective is no one has spoken to anyone in that company for 12, 18, 24 months. Um, they get past the gatekeeper, through to the decision maker, and they deliver a verbal upfront contract, which goes along the lines of, Jeremy, let me tell you in 30 seconds what I'm calling, and then you can decide whether to hang up or to invite me in. Now, if they do five of those a day, experience tells me that within six to 10 months, they will have a full pipeline that is three to five times larger than they need to hit their annual target. Now, if they keep maintaining that, and then they can spend 80% of their time uh, together with marketing and together with the execution team working out how they can grow those accounts. Now, that's smart. It's highly efficient. It's highly productive. It's very profitable. Um, and it eliminates this internal bickering, uh, this internal ego play, uh, so that they can concentrate on the job of growth. Excellent. And so what's the second one? And that's a unique, uh, effective conversation. And what was the second? <coughs> the, the se thank you. The, the second one is to get your uh, at the push prospects and opportunities through the funnel with sufficient velocity that uh, means that at, at a stage probably set, uh, six to ten months in, you have three to five times more prospects in your funnel than you need in order to hit your target. The reason why discounting occurs is fear. Uh, the reason why prospects feel they're able to put salespeople under pressure is fear, and it all stems from a weak inconsistent or empty sales pipeline. If your pipeline had five times more prospects in it than you needed uh, to hit your annual target on day one of the next financial year, how much would you, be, how much would you care if someone says, look, um, we can't buy unless you give us a discount? Okay, that's not a problem. Uh, when, when you spoke to the other companies and told them that you were willing to, uh, they were willing to uh, take your business, at those discounted rates, what did they say? Um, and you, know, you, you push them away because you're confident that you're going to hit your number. If you have five times more prospects in the funnel, i.e. you focus on the problem upstream, which is invariably where salespeople are weak because they hate prospecting by and large, mm -hmm. and they don't do it. They'll find anything to do. They'll go on the internet, they'll do research, they'll uh, do callbacks, um, you, know, you, you can't say no to a prospect if you are terrified that they'll say uh, that they'll um, accept. Um, you can't encourage them to say no to you if you're afraid that they'll say no to you because you don't have enough in the pipeline. How do you get people to where you can say these are your two or three critical metrics? These are things you don't want to do, but they, like, how do you get them to feel like I've I'm compelled to do these. Is it putting them out in public? Uh, Visualizing okay. as goals? How do you do it? Okay. Um, well, you work backwards from where you need to be. And uh, I would always, rather than aiming to hit the bar, I'd always aim to go over it. Uh, so whatever number you're working on uh, in terms of the end result, you work backwards from, uh, say, 120% of target. And you divide that up in the form of a cookbook in terms of the number of closed deals that are required. Mm -hmm. uh, then the number of final of, of proposals that need to be published uh, and signed off on uh, for them to hit that number. Um, so you might have to put, um, if you're really bad, you might have to put three or five proposals out to get one uh, deal in. Uh, then you work backwards from there. Well, how many final meetings result in a proposal? How many second meetings? How many first meetings? How many unique effective conversations? How many dials? How many leads? And what you're doing is you're focusing on the behavior. You know that if someone is not doing their five unique effective conversations a day, that there is a problem. It might be a psychological block. It might be avoidance. It might be fear of failure, fear of rejection. It might be that they're uncomfortable calling above um, their level of assignment. 
uh, to the, where power is, so getting to decision makers. Um, it might be that they're doing avoidance behaviors like sending emails out, writing proposals, uh, going to lots of fruitless networking events, uh, spending time on LinkedIn unproductively and uh, without purpose. Um, so you, what you do is you look upstream and you see where the problem really begins. Is it that they're not doing the behavior? If they're doing the behavior, is it that they're not getting past the gatekeepers? In which case, as the manager, you can give them very specific coaching. Uh, marketing can provide them with messaging um, and can uh, act as the artillery uh, and soften those prospects up uh, with key messaging um, and uh, creating engagement. Um, is it that they're getting past the gatekeeper, but the call dies within the first minute or two? In which case, it's either a problem with their upfront contract, uh, it's a problem with their 30 second commercial, it's a problem with their tonality, or it's a problem with their belief. Um, if they don't believe that they have the right to make that call, then all sorts of problems occur after that. Um, so they will find a way. Uh, remember, the rule is inspect what you expect. If you expect to be treated badly, you'll get treated badly because what you project out gets reflected back. And it's like, uh, it, sorry, it's like, it's like the I said, she said argument that you have with your spouse. I say to my wife, sweetheart, where are my keys? And she says, wherever you left them. And my kid gets hooked, turns to my parent ego state. My dad gets involved and says, are you going to let her get away with that? And so I reply, well, you know, if the place was a bit tidier, her mother gets, her child gets hooked, turns to her mother, says, are you going to let him get away with that? And she says, well, if you weren't such a slob and World War III breaks out. Well, if you have that internal dialogue going on um, when you're making your prospecting calls, odds are you're going to get beaten up. Yeah, you're missing exactly. I mean, I love that analogy. And everyone ends up missing the point in the first place, right? So I also yeah. double up as a marriage counselor. <laughs> um, and so let me then go to a question that I think people probably be having. So we just described with figuring out what's working, what's not, involves a lot of measurement, right? And you have a great line, what you measure happens, what you don't measure does not happen. So yeah. there's a lot of work though, right? Is getting all those metrics, getting them all put together, finding <laughs> how can like a, a, a sales leader, a marketing leader, how, how can they efficiently get those and, and start developing metrics while doing the numerous other aspects of their jobs that they have to to be successful. Okay, well, I'd, actually, I've got to be honest with you. I don't think it really requires a whole heap of measurement. Yeah. I think unique effectives and um, number uh, and uh, the um, pipeline uh, between the qualified and closable stage. Mm. That three to five times needs to be the qualified to closable stage. Um, so what you're concentrating your energy on is moving stuff through the funnel with sufficient velocity um, so that uh, they're getting to the qualified stage, which is 70% of the answers that you need have been uh, taken care of. Uh, closable is you've got 100%. And what you're trying to get to is three to five, 100%, uh, three to five times as many uh, prospects at that stage in the funnel um, so that you're going to hit your number. Now, and just to say, so you're and you referenced this earlier, working backwards. Then, when you're like, when you're looking at, you know, what's working in the process, you start with the closed ones, and you see the going back through the stages, what's driven success and what's driven failure based on what's in your CRM, what's marketing been doing, all that sort of stuff, right? To to an extent, yes, but uh, again, I think there's um, uh, salespeople are. Yeah, I am one, so I don't really see this as being an insult. Uh, and in fact, Carl von Clausewitz, the guy who wrote On Wall, uh, <laughs> used to hire Prussian officers for two qualities, laziness and high intelligence. Minimal loss of life, minimum effort. <laughs> and I think great salespeople need to be the same. I think what great salespeople need to do is they need to uh, plan. And salespeople tend to be lazy when it comes to planning. Um, they need to do an annual plan, uh, and then break that down into 90-day cycles. And each of those 90-day uh, those cycles is made up of their territory. Um, now, what I would always advise people to do is look at their existing accounts and divide them up into A, Bs, and Cs. Um, a spend a shed load of money uh, buying multiple products or services on a regular basis. So let's say they spend um, $250,000 a year plus. Um, Bs... 
uh, say, spe- uh, you know, they're, they're good bread and butter business. Uh, they spend maybe 100 uh, to 249,000 and they buy multiple services. They buy regularly, but not quite as often as the uh, A's and sees anything up to 100,000. And then uh, go to, uh, in Samba Enterprise Selling, we have a model called CARE, K-A-R-E, Keep, Attain, Recapture, Expand. Keep accounts are babysitting accounts that don't really have a lot of growth potential, um, but they're good bread and butter business, they're safe, uh, you can just put a you know, decent account manager on there, and their job is not to drop the ball. But there isn't a lot of growth potential. Um, a is attain. These are new, new business. This is proper uh, hunting. Go out there. Uh, your, your competitors' best customers are your best prospects. Those are the kind of attain accounts that we've got to go after. Um, then there's recapture. These are the ones who used to buy from you, but for some reason have lapsed. You messed up. Um, there was a change of personnel and they brought their fate preferred suppliers in um, or you were lazy or you didn't really look after the account um, and they went uh, and traded elsewhere or tried to do it themselves. Um, and expand accounts. Uh, expand accounts are the ones that are marketplaces in and of themselves. So an expand account uh, would be uh, what I would typically see as an enterprise account. Um, so they might be buying two or three services from you and um, these are the ones that, uh, when you look at your A, B, C list, they could be going from A to A plus. They could be going from B to A or C to B or A. Um, and I would ideally want my salespeople to be spending 80% of their time on expand, which isn't the glamorous, but it is the most profitable. And after all, we're measured on what we keep, not we make, not what we make. Um, it's like in golf, you know, um, uh, drive for show, putt for dough. Um, it's the same thing (laughs) keeping profit is more important I would much rather be running a business of three million making two and a half million profit uh, than a billion pound business losing a hundred million a quarter so you have three there's three things you also have have referenced in the past Uh, getting out of your ivory tower encouraging constructive conflict and team story can you discuss how those work together and how they play into alignment okay absolutely um, well, a sales manager who operates from an ivory tower isn't really getting their, they don't have their finger on the pulse. Um, and remember, a manager's job is only twofold. Hire the best people, get the best out of them. Um, if they're wasting a whole heap of time on supervisory activity, it's because they're focused on the wrong end of the problem. What they should be doing is hiring great people and playing favorites and going out into the field doing windshield training uh, with them getting out into the marketplace, spending time with their salespeople, coaching them. And in fact, the manager drives. The salesperson never drives, so they have no reason to be doing anything other than focus on the questions the manager asks. Um, The manager needs to do pre-call planning uh, and rehearsal with the salesperson. Uh, They need to do a post-call debrief with the standard questions. Okay, Uh, Why did they agree to meet up with us? What was your upfront contract going in? Who was going to be there? What were their individual pains? Uh, what was the budget? What was the decision-making process? Um, what were the, uh, fee, uh, the pains that we need to present back to for them to give us uh, the order? Uh, what's the competitive landscape? That kind of thing. Um, when they're out in the field with the salesperson, they need to be asking questions about, um, well, what worked, what didn't work? What could you have done better? Given your time again, facing that particular objection, how would you reverse that question uh, so that you didn't end up trapping yourself into a box or giving away important, valuable information? Um, because salespeople have their mother on their shoulder answer, they're saying, answer the nice man's question. Um, and too often they give away valuable information. They forget that if they're asked a question which they then have to answer, the rules are you answer in as short a manner as possible. It does you no harm and it ends on a question mark. Um, simple stuff like that. Uh, making sure that they are um, coaching and getting the best out of their salespeople. And then this then feeds into the team sales meeting. The sales meeting should not be uh, that death march of people reporting fictional uh, forecasts. Um, it should be a learning activity. The uh, forecast can be gleaned from the salesperson through a three-minute-a-day conversation with each of the salespeople um, by 
um, speaking to them about what's in the pipeline, what's progressed, what have they disqualified out, um, why will this deal land, what roadblocks are there, and what help do they need. Um, and the sales meeting should be um, an opportunity for them to come up with a solution uh, to the kind of problems that they're facing. So get the salespeople in a room, but I would also get marketing, I would get operations, I'd get the engineers, I would get finance and I'd get um, legal and I'd get all those people into a room on a regular basis, at least once a quarter, but preferably once a month and identify what the problem is and consolidate with a very concise version of either the opportunity, challenge or problem. Then give a background overview of the kind of clarification issues, uh, constraints, um, and um, the kind of problems that, uh, the kind of problems that you, they're uh, facing. And then just actively, proactively, everyone uh, think creatively. And this is about quantity rather than quality. It's about getting lots of ideas out there. Um, and then have the team vote on the top four most likely solutions um, or most likely courses of action that are going to lead to a solution, then come up with an action plan. Um, you know, if you do that team storm, um, the facilitator will direct the process. They'll clarify, summarize, develop the team's ideas. Uh, they'll encourage people. They'll assist. They'll facilitate uh, and keep the team focused and also set the ground rules that um, this isn't uh, an opportunity for everyone to have a gripe at everyone else. Um, every team member has uh, to share ideas and suggestions, build on the suggestions that have already been given, and be supportive, very team focused, listen and encourage the other people. And when we apply this, we get great results. I mean, seriously, the, the kind of results people get off the back of doing this are phenomenal. Um, because you, you, you know, th this is proper synergy. I, you know, I'm reluctant to use the word because it's been so overused. Um, <clears throat> but if you can get five, eight, 10, 12 people in a room all working towards solving the same problem and bringing their creative juices together with their uh, breadth of experience, you can get so much done. And amazing. they're all working towards common purpose. And it's such an amazing contrast, team storming versus pipeline review. I mean, even the rep, I mean, there's no rep in the world that would rather do pipeline review than team storming. I, well, I, the, the, there is one, the guy at the top. The guy at the top. Actually, can see so let, me, let me jump to that then real quick because uh, that's another – this goes to the, the third thing I, in this group. It's something you've, you mentioned before. A players love to be measured. Um, yeah. And then uh, constructive conflict. So <coughs> discuss real quick the concept of public accountability with metrics and having a culture around that in your sales department, your marketing department, uh, success, all that sort of stuff, and and how that okay. plays out with elite elite people in those departments. Okay, um, one thing that we've implemented very successfully with our clients is a daily huddle, and the daily huddle is a version of their journal or their cookbook, uh, which is what are my three behaviours for today, and these might be to disqualify out anything that's been in my pipeline. Uh, and an offer out on the table longer than a week um, to do um, my five unique effective calls and to um, map out the organizational structure of um, you know, company A. Um, then my three behaviors for yesterday were A, B, and C. Um, and how did I do against those yesterday? Is there anything I need to make up and uh, by when? Um, what three lessons did I learn and um, what roadblocks am I facing? And this is where you start to get everybody's input. Now, it starts to get really interesting where um, you're going after, for example, you're doing a product launch or you're doing, uh, entering into a new marketplace or you're trying to break into a particularly uh, attractive account, uh, but you're struggling. Um, so um, what, you, what you want to do is you want to make sure uh, you're getting into uh, the account using everybody's um, uh, brain power. Um, so uh, the salesperson responsible will have a 90-day plan, um, but then you get the team together to team storm, how are we going to break the, into this account? Who do we need to engage with? What are the obstacles? Um, 
who's on side, who's off side, so who's a friend, uh, who's a foe, who's unknown. Um, how can we uh, circle round the wagons uh, to make sure uh, that we're uh, covering off all the bases? What three to five advancements do we need to make in this quarter within this account? How can we make that possible? Um, and I, I think having the different departments in there all you know, putting their case um, as to what contribution they can make um, and how they can all work together, uh, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have arguments. And that's the, the difference between destructive and constructive conflict. Um, if you're working towards common purpose, how do we win JP Morgan as our uh, you know, flagship account supporter? Um, well, th that's all fine and dandy, but if uh, marketing is worrying about branding and uh, their spend, and engineering is worrying about this and that and the other, and R&D is more, more concerned with developing something, uh, some new gizmo, um, and that, you know, you're working at odds with one another. So focus your attention on how do we make the boat go faster um, and get people to argue. The ground rules are that you're not allowed to um, uh, say things uh, that are going to offend the other people, uh, but you are absolutely allowed to um, challenge. And that's the facilitator or the manager's job is to challenge and to hold up, um, you know, to hold people to a higher standard so that you get that constructive conflict. Because I believe that conflict is important. Um, <clears throat> if you have a manager who is a persecutor by nature, what they do is they create a culture of fear and people won't put their head above the parapet, they will not be entrepreneurial, uh, they will not take risks. Um, if you have a rescuer as a manager and they discourage any form of conflict, uh, then what happens is you get this anodyne uh, blandness where you get an awful lot of upward delegation, the manager is run ragged, and you know, a 35 year old looks like they're 70, and they're always complaining about how tired they are. I don't have any sympathy for managers who are tired. Um, but it's their fault, they screwed up. Um, and then you sometimes have a victim manager. This always happens here. Uh, well, you know, frankly, that's the problem with the leader because uh, he was the mug who hired them in the first place. Um, you know, what you need is constructive conflict. You need that uh, structural tension, um, but focused on uh, it's you and the team against the problem and the competition, not you against the team who's against each other, who's against every other department. That's just madness. Yeah, no, and I, 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 that's a, such a great actionable takeaway for like first thing you can do to start doing sales and marketing alignment. Get your team together, figure out a common goal for both sales and marketing to focus on, then have a healthy spirit debate about how to achieve that and encourage everyone to speak out in the, the manner you discussed. I, I love it, Marcus. And um, last quick question. It's actually more of a quest for a story. Uh, regard, it's your ADR story about what happens when sales are <laughs> not joining? <laughs> hear that, and then we'll, uh, we'll sign up after that. But I want people to hear this the story here. Okay, um, th th this is a classic example of uh, misalignment. Um, a client of mine worked for um, a company. Um, I think you've already mentioned them, but I'm not going to for fear of retribution. Um, but, but basically, um, marketing came up with this campaign, which was slagging off. Um, the current pre payroll provider. Um, and uh, it was for the internal sales team that was selling to their existing accounts. Now, now, I mean, how can you possibly be more alt than sending out marketing collateral to your existing customers, telling them that the reasons why they should be aggravated, angry, frustrated, and thoroughly pissed off with their current provider, uh, when in fact, many of them were. I mean, talk about stupid. <laughs> just catastrophic uh just total collapse there in, in alignment i mean yeah please please leave us you know please please raise hell about all the things we're doing wrong that is uh, well, can you imagine the joy it was to be a salesperson on that team going out to meet um the uh the prospects um when the first thing they do is they show them this email and says well this was an interesting email that we got you know, we really need a chat. Ugh. I mean, for God's sake. That is a... Well, it's the antithesis of the Kill Cat campaign. Yes. You know, is... Kill Cat was really simple, well thought out. Everybody knew precisely what they were trying to do uh, versus this marketing fiasco 
uh, with everybody. Um, it's, oh, I, I mean, each time I think about it, um, I just shake my head in despair. Su- suicide by complexity as a company. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, Marcus has been amazing. I, uh, I love uh, this is I'm just, I love having you on, man. I could talk all day about the stuff with you. Tell people where they can read you and watch, watch the videos you put out and learn more about Sandler and all that stuff. Well, um, I can be found on LinkedIn. Um, so I, I'm under, um, basically it's, uh, so, uh, some, sales management trainer um, if you want to look me up um, uh, my, it's Marcus Kauke C-A-U-C-H-I um, if you want to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn that would be lovely if you want to get me on Twitter I'm the underscore inquisitor and that's t- capital T-H-E underscore capital I-N-Q-U-I-S-I-T-O-R um, I'm on YouTube um, there are about 400 videos on YouTube uh, there's just slightly more than 380 blogs uh, on um, LinkedIn. Um, and I, you know, if you've got questions that you want to have resolved, um, then I'm always looking for material for new videos um, because I run out of creative juices. So feel free uh, to throw your problems um, my way and I'll come up with uh, ways to resolve them. Um, and my email is marcus.kauchi, C-A-U-C-H-I, at Sandler.com. Excellent, man. And I can't, I got to add to anyone who's listening, check out uh, Marcus's podcast interview with us on the Sales Influencer Series. Marcus, thanks for coming on. This has been a wonderful session. And everybody, we hope you're enjoying the virtual summit. This is Align 2017. Marcus Couchy, thanks so much.